Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, February 19th, 2024. Coming up on the show today, from Anatomy of a Fall, editor Laurent Seneschal. What we wanted to do is to bring the audience as far as possible in complexity. And we knew that to do that, we were using this genre thriller mathematics. You know, it's the, it's the starting point, but after, it was a way for us to go where we wanted to go. Usually when the, you have images on the screens, it's like evidence. And for us, it was a way to say, pay attention, life is complex, and these images maybe are in the head of a little boy who is trying to help his mother. When we are like starting a scene, we start from the acting and the golden moments, you know. So it's like really artisanal and we don't know where we are going to be at night when we start the day. Yes, all that and more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Okay, podcast time. Let's get to it. We have some catching up to do today. I don't mean you and I, although you know I always like to see you here. What I mean is on the Oscars front. To this point, we have covered all the Oscar nominees for Best Film Editing. The Holdovers, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, Killers of the Flower Moon. But there's one missing, or there was. Not anymore. Today on the show, we have Laurent Seneschal from Anatomy of a Fall. Over the course of the last year, that film has really picked up steam in terms of awards and accolades not the least of which is Laurent's Oscar nomination. If you have not seen the film yet, I will give you the pseudo-Wikipedia summary. A celebrated writer is put on trial when her husband falls to his death from their secluded chalet. What starts as a murder investigation soon becomes a gripping journey into the depths of a destructive marriage. That's a pretty good description. The film starts off as a mystery that becomes a courtroom drama, and then it kind of reveals itself to be something else. Whatever kind of movie it is, at the very least, it's a really good one. Once again, Laurent is cutting for frequent collaborator, director Justine Trier. And when he's not cutting for Justine, he's cutting for her partner, writer-director Arthur Harari. I do think you'll like the film if you haven't seen it, and I certainly hope you like the podcast. I had a lot of fun talking to Laurent, and I always like meeting new editors on the show. You know that. And we will meet Laurent in just a few minutes. First, I got to do a little housekeeping. And someone who is always welcome in my house are my pals from Extreme Music. When they are not busy sponsoring The Rough Cut, they are providing film and TV makers like you the very best in production audio. Audio made by the top names in music making. Names you would be thrilled to have in your end credits, and dropping by ExtremeMusic.com is really all you have to do to make that happen. Once you're there, you can search their catalog with keywords like tempo, genre, composer, and any other little hints you want to give them so they can find you just what you need. You can customize the instrumentation, you can choose different track links, you can even use their amazing reference track feature to give them a track so they can find you ones just like it. All of that stuff, as well as the licensing, can be done online. Or they have actual human beings, nice ones, not the creepy ones you try and avoid at parties, nice people who can help you with the licensing. So the next time you have a story to tell, be it a movie, a TV show, an ad, a PSA perhaps, make sure to visit ExtremeMusic.com. Something else I want to tell you all about is how you can maximize your rough cut listening experience, and that is by doing a little reading along with it. If you type blog.frame.io slash the rough cut into your browser of choice, you will find a fully transcribed version of the podcast, complete with supporting content like Spotify playlists, avid timelines, YouTube videos, social media posts, all this great stuff pulled together on one page to help kick the podcast up a level or two. You can even listen to the podcast through the embedded player on the page and then avail yourself of all those supporting assets. Even I learned a thing or two that slipped past me during the interview. I get it, that says more about me, but let's keep the focus on you. As in, all you gotta do is click that link in the show notes and it will speed you on over to blog.frame.io slash the rough cut. Look at that, I saved you some typing. Now then, we are off to the French Alps for a little mystery and possibly a little marriage counseling. From Anatomy of a Fall, here is editor Laurent Seneschal. I will be there. there. Yeah. Okay, great. You can tell me what a horrible interviewer I am when you see me. (laughs) No, maybe you you are going to say like, uh, my English is not good enough and uh, now your show is... uh, (laughs) Down. <laughs> if anybody's English isn't good enough, it's mine. <laughs> this is your fifth project, I believe, with Justine going back to 2010. Tell me how you first met, because whatever brought you two together has worked out very well for both of you. It's not the fifth one, but it's the fourth one. And uh, among those, we only did the um, three latest feature films. The first feature film of Justine was edited by someone else. Then she came back to me after uh, one documentary we did all together. 
At the beginning, I met Arthur Arari at the university. I edited all the short films of Arthur. Actually, I edited all the <laughs> Arthur Arari's uh, movies. And they are a couple. So um, one day, uh, Justine told me, uh, I need you. <laughs> and I came to help the lady after the man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But they are very different, so it's really nice to work with them because it's like even if they are working together and they are a couple, uh, they are so different and their movies are so different that it's, it's really great for me. This really great movie, it starts out seeming to be about one thing and then it ends up being about another. When you read the script, was there anything about it that you made specific notes about or you thought might be a challenge once you were in editorial? In fact, I'm really an editor with a huge implication when I'm reading the script version. Because with those directors, because we know each other, they give me to read many versions. And for this one, it was not like I was writing a lot of things, not clever things like you should do this or that. It was rather about, wow, it's great, but when it's going to be images, are you sure that it's going to work? For instance, for the argument, I remember I, I told them, you know, uh, you have to, maybe to, it's a point of view that we are going to need. So, uh, of course, it's, it's going to be really long to only have the sound in the courtroom, but you are doing a flashback here. Are you sure? Which point of view is that? It was a question like that, and they told me, yeah, we're going to do that, and it's, we'll see. <laughs> I understood that a good idea, of course, because it was so vivid when, even if it's a flashback, it's catchy, you know? So it worked. It's an example, but there were so many things I, I noted as warnings, you know, when I read the script. Well, those flashbacks, were those in the earliest iterations of the script, or is that something that came to be a necessity over time as they were developing the script? I think that they rather soon figured out that they need to have this big scene with images. Because staying in the courtroom was becoming like, even when we were reading the script, it was like very long audio scene, you know. And of course, it was also a way to put the character of the dead father into the movie and to build some empathy with him. Because the boy is the main character. In fact, at the end of the movie, we discover that the boy is the main character of the movie and is really shocked by, uh, of course, what happened with uh, his father and is picking memories of his father. And you cannot have this emotional end of the movie without having the father existing like that. Also for the couple, the discussion about time and balance things uh, between the, the man and the woman, it was really important to have it with bodies. A big part of this film is a courtroom drama, but I can't think of any courtroom dramas that this film reminded me of. Did Justine talk to you about certain films or filmmakers that she was drawing from in developing Anatomy of a Fall? She had many influences. I think she was talking about Kramer versus Kramer, a movie we love, but it, it was really around family and the boy and the, the couple in the in the courtroom, but um, for the thriller movie, we didn't have a very specific reference, you know. We knew that we were beginning with a genre movie, like a thriller, not showing what happened. And then after every time that you are seeing this woman, maybe she's guilty, you know. This is the, the first thing we did, but it's like a, an original crime that we did. <laughs> and, and then after we wanted not to play that game so much, we knew that it was like a vehicle for us to create a movie more like John Cassavetes could have done. You know, you, you, we wanted the, the audience to be behind this family, this boy and this mother. Even if doubts are still there, of course, it was really hard to build. But we wanted to have the audience behind her. And it was like, you didn't want to be uh, clever about that, you know. And uh, what we wanted to do is to bring the audience as far as possible in complexity. And we knew that to do that, we were using this genre thriller mathematics. You know, it's, a, it's the starting point, but after it was a way for us to go where we wanted to go. What we wanted to do is not to like copy um, the way in the TV show you are going to see very often the courtrooms and uh, all this uh, justice uh, mechanisms, you know. We wanted to be softer about that. And also we wanted to be like it's pieces of reality. 
That's why in the editing, we were picking all these players, first takes, and uh, it was really on purpose that we did that. I have to say, there's not a lot of comedy in the film, but I did laugh when Sandra refers to where she lives as a shithole with the backdrop of the snow-capped French Alps behind her. <laughs> so please tell me you got to edit on location in the French Alps. Or, and if you didn't, where did you edit? No, 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 no. In fact, Justine, I had this experience with her for the two previous movies. She cannot see an assembly. She cannot. Not at all. She is uh, going into a mess as soon as she didn't uh, choose uh, things. She had to start from the very beginning uh, the process. Uh, and this is the faster way, but it's a very long way <laughs> to get the movie. <laughs> but it's the faster way with her because she's, uh, she cannot um, not be there. You know, She cannot see something that she's going to improve. She wants to, do, uh, to be there. Not only to do everything, but she's like a bit of a control freak, you know, in an editing room. And um, why she's like that? It's because the main door for her is to pay attention at first to the actor's performances. The acting is the main thing for her. She wants to, like, be sure that she's having the best moments, the best takes. And it's a very huge, massive work to only choose the good material, and then after trying to uh, arrange this and cut it, you know. Do you communicate at all during production, and what do you talk about if you do? I'm looking at the dailies, and we are talking sometimes, maybe once a week, but I'm not very close to her, because I know that it's like another person when she's coming in, in the editing room. She's like, she, she put re, uh, press a reset button to everything, and she wants to now create something else with all this. And uh, of course, she has some uh, ideas that, yeah, this scene, it was really great uh, what we did. But when we are like starting a scene, we start from the acting and the golden moments, you know. So it's like really artisanal and we don't know where we are going to be uh, at night when we start the day. She doesn't want ideas to compress reality and feelings and uh, acting. She's starting with acting. Then when she has what she is thinking that is good, we are starting to have maybe ideas, but she wants her uh, movies to be more vivid than clever, you know? Okay, well, now we're going to test your memory a little bit. Do you recall how many days of principal photography were there? Nine weeks, maybe 10 weeks. I don't know. I don't remember. 10 weeks sounds about right. I looked at the movie. It seems like a 10-week movie. How about, uh, how about an editorial? How long were you in post for? <laughs> it was 38 weeks. 38 weeks. VFX. It doesn't strike you as the kind of movie that there's a lot of visual effects in there, but sometimes with snow and weather conditions, there can be more than you think. Tell me about the VFX component. How many shots, if you know, and where was most of the VFX work going? It was not huge on this movie, of course, and the snow was real, was for real. But for the VFX, we used them for the dog, for the vomit, and also maybe the snow on the roofs of the chalet. A lot of things that we, we are doing, but it's not really VFX. It's like when you are using the same shot multiple times, you know, because you want to fix the pace of the acting and the rebuilding shots and scenes. And, you know, I do a lot of things like that. There was many, many things to do, but it was not like huge VFX. You'll do things like interframe editing with like Animat and Fluid Morph to adjust performances and things like that? Yeah, I used to do a lot of things like that because we are um, like into details and we want uh, that time before she's turning and this look to be uh, that long <laughs> before uh, having um, the other shot, you know. So we are um, using all the tools to have what we want. I'd like to talk a little bit about guiding the audience, making them feel one way or the other about Sandra, about Samuel, whom we never even really meet until later in the film. The open of the film really influences how we feel about the characters. We don't see Samuel. We just hear that unbelievably annoying song playing over and over again while she's trying to have a conversation. And in her interview with the student that's asking her questions, she says things like, I never see anybody. I work here all day long. Time is not a problem here. 
So you sort of see the frustrations of Sandra, and you also can see how Samuel could make you a little crazy. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you talked about with Justine in terms of like how to make the audience feel one way about Samuel and Sandra at the beginning, then over time play with those feelings until we get to the end? It was the main challenge in this editing, how to create the road for the audience to let the audience drive <laughs> to the left and to the right. And um, for Sandra, it was easier because Sandra Hüller really became the character and it was easy to have what we wanted and she was already there in the scene. So it was um, a big work, but uh, we had everything. It was not tricky. We just had to pay attention not to let her becoming too manipulative or too innocent. It was really a way to guide ambiguity, but not always playing very loud this, uh, you know, this uh, key. For Samuel, it was really important for us to have him exist as much as we could as a phantom, you know. Even when he is alive, he is a phantom because his body is the music. And of course, he's really invasive with this music, but he is like a shadow. So um, we had decided in editing to have a title scene with pictures of the family. It was a way to have him exist, also uh, have an image of him. We have this uh, little scene when we see him on the screen, on the laptop. Uh, she is looking at, it, at him and we don't have the sound, but there is this uh, like complicity between, uh, within them. It's a really strange little scene. And then this uh, argument scene. But of course, we wanted him to not to be too weak, but also it was important for him to see that he, he had these weaknesses. And um, yeah, the game was to, to reverse things between usually the man and the woman. And the end was really important. The boy is uh, he's using his memory maybe to invent something that his father told uh, in order to, to help uh, the mother. You, you know, it's... it's uh, it's not sure, but it might be like that in the head of the viewer. And um, it's funny because it's uh, really uh, what Justine is uh, is doing. She's um, really uh, like breaking the rules because she's doing, we could say, as uh, in usual suspect, you know, because usually when the, you have images on the screens, it's like proofs, it's like evidence. And for us, it was a way to say, pay attention, life is complex. And these images maybe are in the head of a little boy who is trying to help his mother. Well, in terms of revealing characters, well, let's talk about Daniel, the boy, a little bit. His limited eyesight becomes a factor in part of the story, but it's not something that's clear right away. Keeping that information from the audience for a little bit, was that something that you were, again, conscious of? This will matter to the story how soon or how late we hold this information back. <laughs> it's such in the middle of the police investigation. We knew that was going to be clear at one point. And we tried not to do as usual in the movies with, uh, you know, uh, the, f the first 15 minutes, you know everything about every character. Same, for instance, it's a detail, but when in the courtroom, the prosecutor is uh, asking the student, did you know that uh, she was bisexual, Sandra? And I asked Justine, are you sure you don't want to have a, a shot on Sandra there because uh, we are talking about uh, her sexuality and uh, or maybe the student and she said no let's try not to be like that because today it's it could be not that important let's stay on the prosecutor and uh, it's going to be okay she is a little yeah you know um, like a, <laughs> a bad girl sometimes <laughs> you know and i have to to make sure that even if uh, she is breaking the rules we are going to find our rule so i'm trying in our uh, complementary uh, way to work I, i'm the one who is trying to find balance between all these ideas and some of them are really explosive you know so going back to how we view sandra she's very isolated she's often seen alone in shots, often in close-up. We don't often see her in two shots when she's in a scene with somebody. One of the things that was most striking to me is the weekend before the climax of the trial, Daniel says, I don't want my mom to be here with us. And so Vincent, her lawyer, her friend, comes to pick her up and drive her away. Mm -hmm. The entire time in that car ride, we never see Vincent's face. And they're having a conversation. 
not until like the final scene in the restaurant do we see Vincent and Sandra in a real two shot. Mm -hmm. I know it's not strictly like there was never a two shot, but it does seem very often Sandra was isolated in these shots and these scenes. Is that just my interpretation or do you feel like that was something that you were trying to do? For me, it's really interesting <laughs> because uh, we didn't aim to do that, but I have the same feeling that there is something hard inside her at the end, but it's also the end and uh, she's released, you know, so it's peaceful, even if there is some um, strange taste in her mouth and in her mind, because she has to come back and it's hard to face the boy. So a big part of the film, of course, is the courtroom. How many cameras did you have in that courtroom scene? And while I'm asking about it, what did they shoot for Anatomy of a Fall? Very often there were two cameras on the courtroom, only two, I should say. <laughs> and sometimes they were in the same uh, axis, you know, shooting the same um, angle. I think that because it's not a very expensive uh, movie, you know, we had to, to be clever. So I used a lot of uh, shots from other scenes to build uh, some other scenes, you know. And um, I think the, the material was, uh, was not light, but... Uh, we didn't have so many takes. Uh, Justine is shooting a lot with the main character. And when an actor is in a weak moment, she is uh, really trying to have what she wants. But, <laughs> but she's uh, like um, rebooting everything without cutting, you know. So the material is uh, <laughs> strange. And I really have to, to adapt and to organize the material before editing. But uh, without doing an assembly edit, it's hard. <laughs> I, I had to organize really, really, really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the pacing of the film, it seems like in some of the answers you've given me, Justine purposefully didn't want to do things that people would expect for this kind of film. Films often will use techniques for compressing time, montage, things like that. But I don't feel like you ever really tried to tighten the film up. I know it's coming out like a negative, but <laughs> you really let the film breathe. And so I would just like to get your thoughts on how you approach the pacing of the film, the things you tried to do and the things you purposefully stayed away from. Okay, there are two parts for this question, the first part and the courtroom part. The first part, we had to rebuild a lot the scenes and the way the boy is existing also. And into the scenes, we had to also cut a lot of dialogues. And, but the um, climate of... All this work, of course, we are also trying to have a, the better beginning for a movie when we are an editor. But Justine told me something, and it was, I think, something that we kept in mind for all the process. She told me, even if it's my last movie, I don't want to be in a rush. I want to breathe. She, she told that. I want some scenes to be like very long and calm also. I want the audience to stay there. I'm confident some of them are going to be with us. So let's do what we want. And she didn't want to be stressed by going fast at the beginning. But what she was really uh, stressed about was that every moment was a performance of the acting uh, very intense for her, uh, such as the boy when he's in front of the investigation judge. Maybe we spent three days only to choose <laughs> the, the, the good material on this. And there were many options, of course. And we did many versions. And it was the way for her not to be in a rush. And for the courtroom, what was hard was to go back to the house. Because when we were in the courtroom, even if the scenes were a bit long sometimes, we knew that it was like the, the contract between the audience and us. We knew that we were going to have long scenes and, and it was going to be harsh sometimes. But as soon as we went back in the house, we really had to fix it really carefully because it was really hard to come back to the courtroom after, you know. It was really hard to rebuild this. For instance, the boy, when the boy is uh, doing all his um, experience about the, the dog and the vomit, it was not like that in the script. It was like earlier and there were many scenes in the house and in the courtroom and in the house and in the courtroom. It was alternate. But we chose to stay longer in the courtroom and after go back to the house. The idea that he is pushing his mother 
before doing the experience was an editing idea. In regards to the visual language of the film, there was something you did that I didn't notice you doing anywhere else, and that was in Sandra's rehearsal scene for her testimonial, you do a fade to black, which I don't recall you doing anywhere else. Was that meant to be any sort of punctuation or a break there, or is that the basic start of the third act? How do you define why you did that? In fact, we had this question, how to go to the trial? And it was not written as it is in the movie. And it was like we were in the courtroom in a cut, you know, after the rehearsal. For me, it was impossible to cook it like that because it was like losing all what is good before and losing the beginning of the courtroom. I wanted to be thinner here. And uh, we used the boy when he's playing the piano and it's the ellipse of one year passing. It's just after that. And it's footage that was supposed to come at the end when he hears that the mother is free, you know. This idea was to put the boy as the main stone of the second part, of the trial uh, part. This whole fade to black was to breathe before going into this second part that we knew that it's going to be harsh and they are going to open every weaknesses of uh, Sandra and everything that we heard at the beginning of the movie. And it was a way to like a musical stop and go again, you know? So was Daniel meant to be getting better at that piece over time? Because he's kind of played it the same. <laughs> Didn't sound like he got better. Don't say that. <laughs> Just a musical critique. No, um, we had to use these piano scenes differently in order to have the boy exist a lot during this first part. Because he's really important in the movie. And even in the courtroom, we have to see him very often and we have to, we had to find ideas to not to lose the boy, you know, uh, during all these two hours. Of course, we used uh, the material uh, in the, not in the order of the set, you know. Of course. Yeah. So you saw that and um, maybe uh, <laughs> well, I have to edit it again. No, no, no. Maybe he just hadn't been practicing. He's had a lot on his mind. I don't blame him. <laughs> I would like to talk about one scene in particular, and that is in the courtroom, I'll call it the USB key fight scene. Mm -hmm. Samuel has recorded a fight between the two of them, and we see it play out for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then there's some violence that takes place between the two of them, and we never see that part of it. So did they actually shoot that part of it? And did you decide it's more powerful not to see the fight? It was written like that, but the fight was going longer before... It was starting, in fact, the hands <laughs> were, were coming before. But um, we figured out that it was better to go back in the courtroom when words are like uh, weapons. And the words Sandra is saying and the way she acts were the um, climax here. And um, it was better footage than what they did try to do <laughs> after. So we wanted to go back in the courtroom in that climax. And of course, the fact that violence is not seen again, it's a way to go back to, to the beginning of the movie where you don't see what happened. It's like contradiction. This scene, this flashback, where we are seeing as God a scene that we cannot see because it's only sound. It was a way, I think, to be our own contradiction, you know, in order not to lose the audience also. We had to find some things to be, like, catchy. I, I don't know how to, I don't have enough words in English, you know. But we didn't want to have uh, score music, but we wanted to have big ideas and even contradictory ideas sometimes. But it was in order to be, like, uh, to have the audience be surprised and be um, into this... Uh, movie in the movie, because it's a, it's a scene around the, what is in the middle of uh, what we are talking about. It's about time, couple, balance, and what is to be an individual into a couple. What is freedom? What is regret? What is all this? The flashbacks that Daniel has, if I recall, it's not exactly clear initially, are we seeing those as flashbacks of his? Are we seeing those through his mind? Yeah, it was in this scene of uh, testimony where, for us, he is playing some images. He is becoming the director of the movie. He's shooting and playing his father, and uh, the voice is, is uh, like the voice of the scriptwriter, you know? He's editing it too, Laurent. 
Yeah, of course. <laughs> but uh, I, I helped him because we had so many versions of this. <laughs> <laughs> he needed a mentor. <laughs> we all do. Of course. <laughs> There's a lot of this film to be proud of. If you can, what was your favorite scene from the film to work on? Wow. To work on or to see after as a, as a part of the audience? <laughs> Both, if you care to. <laughs> okay. To work on is the argument, the fight, and the 20 minutes scene after the last huge scene of the trial where it's amazing where we, they are talking about uh, literature and when the prosecutor is uh, like reading a previous novel uh, and they are talking about, uh, are you guilty? Is uh, Stephen King guilty because he's writing uh, killer uh, novels? This time, uh, for me, it's really um, like talking about, the movie is talking about more than this story and this couple and this affair. It's like talking about today. What is today? Today, if you have written something in the social media or 10 years after, you can be like in a trial for this, you know. <laughs> and it's, uh, it was, it's a really funny moment and very long scene. And uh, it's one of the hardest scenes I had to, to edit because it's so long. We, I had to be really precise and uh, even be confident that it was going to work like that. And I'm proud to have done it. But the scene that is uh, moving me is the very simple scene where the boy is playing the piano the last time before testifying. And also the last scene when the looks in silence with the mother is uh, when they are reconnecting at the end. Those two moments are really moving for me because I really appreciate, of course, as everybody, when a movie is stopping uh, all the dialogues and it's becoming like so simple. and It's complex, but you understand everything only with the looks and only with the face. And uh, for me, it's great when it's like that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think people are recognizing how wonderful this film is and the tremendous work that you did. I wish you nothing but the best this award season. The only thing I'm disappointed about is learning that the dog was VFX. I thought that dog should have gotten an Oscar. <laughs> no, no, he's a, great, he's a great actor. He won the Palma Dog, and he's a great actor, but we, we didn't help the dog. We help the vomit. <laughs> I'm telling you, that dog deserves some kind of canine Oscar. So what if you got a little VFX help with the vomiting? Meryl Streep would need help with that. My vote for Best Supporting Actor goes to Messi the Border Collie who played Snoop the Wonder Dog. And of course, best of luck to Laurent as well when Oscar night comes. He did a great job on the film, and I loved having him on the show today. I hope you enjoyed it too. Did you know that four out of five Best Film Editing Oscar nominees chose Avid Media Composer to cut their films? And I bet there was an Avid somewhere in the mix for the fifth one. What I'm saying is they must have their reasons for choosing Media Composer. And maybe those reasons wouldn't be the same as yours. Everybody's different, thankfully. But you'll never know what your reasons for liking Media Composer will be until you try it. And if you have tried it, well, have you tried it lately? There are always great new features and functionality going into Hollywood's most trusted nonlinear editing system. So head on over to the Media Composer page at avid.com and check it out. As always, there's a link in the show notes just for you. Well then, it seems we have reached the end of our little editorial journey. But just for today... Hopefully you come back again and we can meet some new people next week. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>